the second passage is basically a coda to that first passage. 20 years passes, and as he begins to paint and find his confidence as an artist technically, he's at a loss as to what he should finally really paint to, to give himself that element of self-expression that he so desperately wants to show the world. And as he's just the most down and out in the whole book, and he looks at another reflection in the, in the I believe it's the, the window pane of a coffee shop, and he sees how bedraggled he looks, and he looks at his face really carefully, and then the obvious finally hits him. Uh, setting up my easel, and he's living now in a loft in New York, uh, sharing it with other painters. Setting up my easel, I began to make a foundation of white gesso on a large linen canvas, and over it painted broad, seamless swatches of red. The photo storm, my friend, took were invaluable, but I didn't rely on them totally for shape and color. Those came from inside me. I didn't have to dig very far. My sense of who I was dictated short, violent stabs of the brush. My flesh tones became a sea of ochre, burnt umber, tinted brown and black. With a palette knife, I shaped and bled the colors into one another. The image that came to life was disjointed and grotesque. The face was half in profile, half frontal, and twisted to its right side, like someone alerted to a danger that was closing in. The nose was disproportionately large, and the eyes sunken. The forehead was pushed back, shooting over the dark hairline. The, tin, the chin stuck to my face like an appendage. I could feel the painting's primitive agitation and upheaval. It wasn't e easy to distinguish between line and color. The self-portrait had come off my brush in a series of lightning storms. I looked like a savage under a boiling red sky. When your emotions are an undammed river, it's hard to stop them or to do anything else. In a 10-hour binge, I completed a painting I didn't want to make a single change to. In the morning, Storm couldn't stop studying it. He told me I had given expression to a personal pain that any sane person would have fled from, never looking back. I had stared into the sun. The following week, I painted my full torso, tubular and twisted like melted plastic. My hands and legs were in a state of disintegration. The face was hidden behind shadows, barely visible against a midnight blue that seemed to freeze the whole tableau. There was no motion this time. My body had already been pulled apart. I dug deeper for the next painting, creating a 10-year-old boy sitting alone on a corner of a lawn with a fence around him. I concentrated less on his face than an atmosphere of isolation. My lines were more delicate than in the first two paintings. I thought of my brush as a scalpel. Pain wasn't always an explosion. It could be a series of moments gathered over time layered on top of each other like nerve endings, until the pain was so intense, the weight became unbearable. It was as if you were a house and the roof suddenly caved in. I went on to paint a slightly older boy running in a playground. In preliminary sketches, I conveyed his identity in silhouettes, three of them in motion. Yet when I began to add color, the torsos became three-dimensional. They were realistically drawn except for their large heads. In one figure, the boy's hands were raised above his head, covering it. In another, he was looking behind him, chased by something. In the third, he was slumped over at the waist, exhausted and out of breath. Every night, I would fall into bed, too tired to pick up a book or newspaper. Occasionally, I sent my father an email that I was okay. Honestly, I said, but I didn't elaborate. I didn't want to lose myself to distraction. In the morning rested, I began painting again with no clear idea where I wanted to go. An image emerged from the ground of inert colors. In the right combinations, the colors shaped themselves into wild, startling emotions. The magic of reconstruction, I thought, was the magic of the impossible. I remembered my sessions with Dr. Glasspill, the therapist, how his gold pen would stop in the middle of a page waiting for me to confess the depth of my misery. I was never able to do it. Years later, in a drafty New York loft, I found my own exorcism and liberation. With painting, you were essentially talking to yourself, and suddenly I had a lot to say.